The title of today's message is Blessed Are You. And I think that you will be surprised you know, as you listen to the Word of God, the meaning behind all that. Text is from Luke chapter 6, verse uh, 20 to 26. Let's all rise for the reading of the Word. Is today it is from uh, uh, the Word of God is from Luke chapter 6, verse 20 to 26. And we are reading from ESP, English Standard Version. Please follow along as, he, as I read the word of God. And he raised his eyes toward his disciples and began, to, began saying, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you will be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when the people, when the people hate you, when they exclude you, and insult you, and scorn your name as evil on account of the Son of God, Son of Man. Rejoice on that day and jump for joy, for behold, your reward is great in heaven. For their fathers used to treat the prophets the same way. I bet you this portion you rarely hear. Woe to you who are rich, for you are receiving your comfort in full. Woe to you who are well fed now, for you will be hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, for you will mourn and weep. Woe to you when all people speak well of you, for their fathers used to treat the false prophets the same way. Hear the word of the Lord, and God's people say, thanks be to God. You may be seated. Most people are familiar with the Sermon on the Mount, which begins by saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for there is a kingdom of heaven. And it's the poor, uh, blessed are those who mourn, it talks about, and blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Most people do not remember this passage in the Bible. Sometimes they call it Sermon on the Plain, not airplane, Sermon on the Plain. Or someone on the level ground. Okay? I, and so I, be, I bet you have never heard it. We are looking at it today. Let's pray a little bit. Let's come. Father, we come today in the great, beautiful name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Our Savior who came to save the world. Who came to restore all things unto God. And you are bringing the kingdom of God on earth. Making all things right. We come today. We love you, God. We ask today that we will meet with you as we worship God. We will see your face, behold your beauty and glory. We want to know you, God. We want to encounter you. We love you, God. Come and speak to us. Meet with us. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. After calling and choosing and appointing the 12 as apostles out of the disciples, Jesus gives a sermon. Some call it Sermon on the Plain. Now, I want, I want to just give a little bit of context here. At the, what, what was happening at the time was that our oppositions, were, oppositions were growing. There are people who are beginning to stand against Jesus, the religious leaders, and even the political leaders were coming and really even plotting to even destroy Jesus. And the place when Jesus gave this sermon was down the mountain, level place, a, a, plain, a level place, a plain. In, in verse 17, uh, and it says, in early right, passage right before this says, and he came down, from the, came down from the mountain with them, the 12, stood on the level place with a great crowd of his disciples and great multitude of people from all Judea, Jerusalem, and, and the sea coast of Tyre and Sidon. And Jesus was on the mountain, prayed all night, and called, and 12, those among the disciples were with him, called and chose 12 as apostles. And called them as apostles. And then he comes down from the mountain, and the people are waiting. The great crowds of disciples are waiting. As well as a great multitude, more people, people who, are, who came. And they, these people came, And from all over Israel, all over Israel, Judea and Jerusalem and all the places. 
the great crowd of disciples and, and the great multitude of peoples. Now, I just, I just highlight it to say, uh, uh, here in the Gospel of Luke, he seems to mention there are at least three groups of people here. There are 12, who you call apostles, and, all, and 12, the 12 disciples. And then there were other disciples. And then there were great crowd of disciples. There were like three or four concentric circles, like maybe 12 at first, and then maybe 100, and maybe, maybe even hundreds. And then there were great multitude of people who are all coming. In verse 18 and 19 it says, who came to him, who came to hear Jesus and to be healed of their diseases and those who were troubled with unclean spirits were cured and all the crowd sought to touch him. For power came out of him, Jesus, and healed them all. And a lot of ministries going on here. And all the, all the crowd, all the people wanted to Touch Jesus. Because of all the things he has done, people are coming to touch him. People are coming in many, you know, with varying degrees of commitment to him. Of coming. Now I want you to notice something here. You know, in, in that verse right there, in this verse, ni- in ni- verse 19, in 18 and 19, people are getting healed and demons are going out and he was teaching them. All that he has done over there at the time he summarizes, the Gospel of Luke summarizes in two verses, giving no details whatsoever who got healed or not. But he goes on to write about, mentions about the sermon that he gave. I believe this is a longer sermon than what is, what is recorded here. And, uh, and Luke uh, put, uh, really gives a little bit of a portion of his sermon that he gave on the, on the place. Now he gives whole chapter 6 about the sermon. Now, that day he was, he did miracles and signs and wonders and healed and did all kinds of things. He doesn't say much about it, but he gives a whole lot of space for the word preached. Now, look at verse, verse look at verse um, 20, our verse. Let me, look at, look at the first line. This is important. And he raised his eyes toward his disciples. It's just a simple thing. Why is this important? Because this tells you who this sermon was for. There were a lot of people. You know, remember, remember there were 12 and there were other disciples. There were a crowd of disciples and, and the multitude of people. Who is he speaking to? He's lifting up his eyes, looking at the disciples. Not the whole man. He's speaking to the disciples. Those who are following Christ. Okay? And he began saying, Blessed are you. Blessed are you. Who? And, and let me stop here. Blessed means happy are you. Happy are you. And talking about blessings. Now, a blessing can mean a lot of different things. And what, what is a blessing? What do you see as a blessing in your life? Jesus begins, by, he begins his sermon by saying, Blessed are you. Begin to tell the disciples that who you are, what should be your blessing, what is a blessing that you should be seeking, what is a blessing for the disciple, what it means to be blessed in God, what it means to be happy in God as the followers of Jesus Christ. He says four things. Blessed are the poor, blessed are the hungry, blessed are those who weep, blessed are those who are hated. That's something that I've been looking for. What do you think blessing is? Blessed are you if you're rich. Blessed are you if you have a beautiful home. Blessed are you when people speak nice things about you. What is a blessing? He begins by saying, blessed are you who are poor. At least in the Gospel of Mark, it says, blessed are those who are poor in spirit. Is being poor a blessing? Is being poor a blessing? Is it? How many of you think being poor is blessing? I don't know. Not me. I think being rich is better than being poor. I like to have some things. Don't you? I do. You know, I, I, I don't think I'm being very secular here, but I, I like some things. Okay, I like, I like being comfortable than being poor. He said, blessed are you who are poor. 
For yours is the kingdom of heaven. You know, and, and then he goes on to say, Blessed are you, secondly, blessed are you who are hungry now. How many of you are hungry? You know, our church Sunday service is always in the middle of the day, and it's sort of awkward, awkward whether you can have a lunch before you come, you can have a lunch afterwards, you are hungry in between. How blessed are you who are hungry now? In, 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 in Matthew's version, in, in Matthew's the Sermon on the Mount, that sermon, it says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Sounds so much more holy, so much more beautiful, right? But he just, here Jesus says, blessed are you if you're hungry now. If you're hungry, you're blessed. There's one, you know, there's one, you know, of course, being hungry is not a blessing in itself. Something about being hungry is certain way, Jesus says, in the kingdom of God, in God, his kingdom is a blessing. There is a verse that I love. And you know, that, play, that play Bible speaks about certain kind of hunger that is really a good hunger. Psalm 63, one is one of my favorite psalms. Oh God, you are my God. I shall seek you earnestly. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh yearns for you. In a dry and weary land where there is no water. There is a spiritual hunger. God, I, I thirst for you. I'm hungry for more of you. That's a good thirst. And, and, but yet here you just literally just say, blessed are you who are hungry now. No qualification. The third he said, blessed are you who are weeping now. You are weeping now, you are blessed. In, 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 in the Matthew's gospel, in, in that sermon on the mount, said, blessed are those who mourn. He talks about mourning in that way. But here Jesus says, blessed are you who weep. And then fourth thing, this is even worse. Blessed are you when people hate you. You are blessed when people hate you. You, are you, people do, that do people hate you? Are you rejected? You are blessed. Sounds really weird. Blessed are you when people hate you. When they exclude you or reject you. When they, when they were to go isolate you. And, when they, and, and insult, insult you. And scorn your name as evil. This is the key. On account of Jesus. Because you are following Jesus. Because you are following Christ as his follower, disciple. You get hated, you get excluded, you get insulted, you get scorned, spoken as evil. Because of that, then you are blessed. Shocking, isn't it? Not expected. This is different from what the world says are blessedness. Even different for a lot of religious leaders at the time. And if you ask Pharisees those say, if you say, blessed are the, they will call Psalm 1. Blessed is a man who does not walk in the way of, and, and blessed are those, blessed is the one who meditate in the word of, word of the Lord. Oh, the, or, or the, the, the Psalm 119, blessed is the one who obeys the word of God. They will say, but Jesus said, no, blessed are you when you're hungry, when you're poor, when you weep because of the sake of Jesus Christ following him. That's not what you... It's not what we want to, what we hope for, but two words, I, two words, I, I, two word of phrase, probably, I bet you, you missed. You missed when you, when you read this, this sermon. One word was now. When you're hungry now. When you weep now. Talking about something that's happening right now. The God's promise is eternity. You may be hungry right now for a little bit, but you know, you'll be, you'll have, his blessing and satisfaction for eter eternity. And second phrase or word is on the account of the Son of Man. He, Jesus is a favorite title. Jesus calls himself with Son of Man. He is the Messiah. He is, a, he, is a, uh, he is the Savior of the world that he came. He is fully God, fully man that he came. He calls himself Son of Man because of, because of me. Hungry now. Weep now, he says. On the account of the Son of Man. You know, I want you to, I want, this is a verse that I love. John 15, verse 20. Jesus says this to his disciples on the night before he goes to the cross. 
Remember the word that I said to you. A slave is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will keep yours also. If they persecuted me, which they did, they'll persecute you. Perse being persecuted as a follower of Christ in this world is normal. In 2 Timothy 3, 12, it says, in fact, everyone, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Now, you know what, you know what Jesus is doing here? As he, as he selected the 12 to be his disciples and apostles, and now Jesus is defining what his kingdom is like, what people, disciples are living, what kind of values they are living with. We are, we are, I don't know how many of you watched the Chosen series I've been watching, re-watching, I just love it. I'm finding things that I love, and there's a phrase that I love in the midst of one of the, in the midst of it, Jesus says in the, the, the Chosen series, Get used, get used to being different. Get used to different, he says. The phrase is, get used to different. How many, have you, how many, how many, how many of you watched the Throughout Chosen series and saw that? He said, be, be, what did he say? Be, be used to, get used to different. Not even be, get used to different. His kingdom is different kingdom. Jesus Christ came to save, uh, save uh, seek and save the lost. He came to restore the world unto God the Father. He came to restore everything right as he does, as he do that. This is why he heals, but this is why he delivers. This is why he dies on the cross as he, as he brings his kingdom, as he brings his, the new life that is in, in the kingdom of God. Everything is different. He's making everything different. His kingdom is very different from this world. Very different. This is why it says, if we are poor in this world for the sake of Christ, if you choose to be poor for the sake of Christ, if you choose to even weep now for the sake of Christ, you are blessed. And goes on to say, rejoice. Jump for joy, he says. Jump for joy. Right? She said, you are blessed. Rejoice in that, in that day. Jump for joy in that day. Why? Why? It says in the verse, For behold, your reward is great in heaven. For their fathers used to treat the prophets in the same way because your reward is great in heaven. You are not living. When you follow Christ, when you're living in his kingdom, you are not living for today. You're living for his kingdom, the eternal kingdom that he's bringing. This, the eternal kingdom that started right now will go on until fulfilled when he returns. We are living for the kingdom, for eternity. There's a great reward. And not only that, he says, your reward is great in heaven. He also says, your four, their fathers used to treat the prophet in that way. You know what he's saying? You are being treated like the prophets of old. You are going to get prophet's reward. If you are treated like the, treated badly like the prophets, you will receive the prophet's reward. That's, that's what's happening right here. Then he doesn't stop there. This is where no other gospel mentions. This is not in, in the Sermon on the Mount. But, woe to you. Now, this is important. Now, who is he saying this to? He's saying that the people who are out there who does not know God? No, he's just speaking to disciples. Those are supposed to be following him. Those who want to follow Christ, he says, woe to you. Who, you know, if you if you do a little bit as you think about it a little bit, there's a parallel things going on here. Four things, four blessedness, four woes, and they match each other. Woe to you, first of all, who are rich. Remember, blessed are you. Blessed are you who are poor. Now, woe to you, are rich, for you are receiving your. Comfort in full. He's saying, Jesus says, woe to you are rich in this world because oh, oh, you're getting old, everything you get, everything you get here is all what you get. There's no reward in heaven. There's not, no reward in the kingdom of God that's coming. All what you get is what you get. 
2 Corinthians 8, 9, you know what Bible says. I, I love this verse. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor. God who was rich became poor for our sake, so that you, through him, might become rich. He chose to be, become poor for our sake. That's our Lord. People in the kingdom of God, his followers, are choosing to be poor for his sake, for his others, for his kingdom's sake. Woe to you, secondly, who are well fed. Now you eat well now. I saw some of you, some of us, some of our people. I saw a number of posts yesterday about Urijib. You know, and they all, I don't know why everybody in our church is loving Urijib. Maybe it's because they're friends or something. I don't know. So, well, food is okay. But anyway, so, and we are putting, you know, and food is a lot. We, and after we ate, we have to take some home. Woe to you who are well fed now. Not, not because you went to Urijib, but, you know, well fed now, right? For you will be hungry. You will be hungry when? When the kingdom of God comes. But there's a story that I, you know, I, I, I found really talks about being hungry in God. Being hungry in God. Okay? And in one of my favorite philosophers, Soren Kierkegaard, Danish uh, philosopher, he told a story this way about a duck. The wild, the wild duck that was flying in, a, in, in his flock on a springtime northward toward uh, Europe. During his flight, he came down on a Danish barnyard where there were a lot of ducks were there. He enjoyed some of the corn, stayed for an hour, and then for a day, for a week, then four months finally, he stayed there the whole summer. Well, relishing and enjoying the good food and the fare and safety in the barnyard. He stayed whole summer. But one, after, one, one autumn day, one autumn day that fall, when the flock of the ducks were winging and flying, you see the sound of the, the wild ducks in the, flying and going on the, on the trip and, and uh, going southbound. They passed the barnyard. He hears the sound. He heard their cry and, and, and all this noise. He was stirred strange, strangely inside. He wanted to go join them. With the great flapping of wings, he rose in the air to join his old, old comrades in their flight. Then he found out his good food and all the good food aid and all the good fare that he had made him soft and heavy. He could rise on no higher than just you know, above the, the barn. Couldn't go any further. So he dropped back down to the barnyard and said to himself, Oh well, my life is safe, and safe here and food is good. Every spring and autumn when he hears the sound of the wild birds calling, his eyes will gleam for a moment. He'll begin to flap his wings. But one day, a final day came when he hears the sound. He will, not, he will not stir him. He will not even move. He will not even you know, stir, the stir, stir up or flap his wings anymore. He became comfortable in that place. You get comfortable in this world enough. You are you're being fed in this world. This is what you're living for. We get comfortable here. We, for we do not understand, forget the vision that is calling his kingdom. May we never be domesticated. May we never become so well fed in this world that we never hunger for things above. May we never be domesticated. That's what he's talking about. Woe to you who are well fed here right now. You are comfortable in this world. You are, you are rich in this world because you are, you, are, you are working with the system. You are being part of it. You get rich in this world. Third, he said, woe to you, laugh now. He's not saying you shouldn't joke around, be cheerful. He, he's talking about, talking about not able to weep at the right thing and laughing at the wrong things. Woe to you who, who laugh now, for you will mourn and weep later. We are called to weep over things. We are, we are called to, we should 
move, be moved, that we should have called to weep over things in this world, the things that breaks his heart. You know, the, 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 and over, we should weep over lost soul. We should weep over those who are bound to hell. We should weep over the injustice in this world. We should weep over, we should weep over things that is evil in this world, like sex trafficking going on, and human trafficking going on, and racism, and all kind of things. Also, over those who lack in this world, but who without their, un, un, unless they turn to Christ, who are bound for eternal damnation, we should weep over things. Let me ask you, are you able to weep over the right things? Do we find ourselves laughing at the wrong things, with the wrong things in this life? Think about that. Jesus is saying, in my kingdom, his kingdom is bringing, in, in it, as his followers of Christ, we are called. We, we will weep when you look around and those are hurting. And he says, there's one of my favorite, one of, I have many, many favorite songs. Usually there's a line, a phrase in a song, a praise that really sticks to me. This is something that I, I really hit me like 15 years ago. 15 years ago, 2007. Heal my heart and make it clean. Open up my eyes to the things unseen. Show me how to love like you have loved me. Break my heart for things that break yours. Everything I am for is the kingdom's cause. As I walk from here, earth, into eternity. The song says, I'm, I want my heart to weep and break over things that break your heart, God. That is a right heart. That is the kingdom heart, those who follow Christ. Woe to you when all people speak well of you. We are, you are so comfortable, you are so well adjusted in this world. Everybody says good things about you. Meaning you can so come, get comfortable in this world. But woe to you when all people speak well of you. For their fathers used to treat the false prophets in the same way. You are, the, you are becoming like, well, you, you see you are followers of Christ, but you are so comfortable in this world, you are false prophets. You are false prophets. I, I, I'm going to quote somebody what he says. If you are acceptable and popular with the people who live according to the spirit of this present evil age, if you are comfortable and acceptable, acceptable, with the people who live according to this age, we may be, in fact, belong to this evil age. Thus, share in their judgment. If, if you are seeking to be liked and loved by everyone in this world, that's what you're living for. You end up becoming like one of them, one everybody out there who does not know God, who are bound for destruction, who are part of this world that is decaying. We may be part of this whole thing. I want you to, I'm, I'm, I'm closing with this. Look at this. This was the, the Dietrich Bonhoeffer, 20th century martyr and a theologian. He says, suffering then is a badge of true discipleship. The disciple is not above his master, Jesus said. That is why Luther, reformer in 16th century, reckoned suffering among the marks of a true Christian. Discipleship means allegiance to the suffering Christ. Following Christ means you are, following Christ means you are, you are aligning yourself with the one who has suffered. Christ who suffered for us. And it is therefore not all surprising that Christians should be called upon to suffer for his sake. In fact, it is a joy and a token of his grace. Isn't it? Jesus said, blessed are the poor. Blessed are you who hunger now. Blessed are you who weep now. Blessed are you when people hate you, reject you, ostracize you, insult you, curse you, because you follow Christ Jesus. Blessed you are. Rejoice. And jump for joy, he says. 
Jesus is calling. Will you follow me? This is the kingdom that I'm calling. With all those are coming, not only 12, but a lot of those who call themselves disciples. And those people out there who came to touch him. This is my kingdom. Would you want it? Will you come? This is what he's inviting. This is the gospel. Perfect. All the kids are here. How appropriate today. Let's have a praise team come. How appropriate today we are celebrating the communion. Can you move this thing? You know, this, you know, as I, as, as I, uh, I just want to say something very personal here. You know, I've been studying the Word of God for a long time. I preach the Bible in many different ways. And I'll be honest, this is the first time I'm really preaching through the whole book without missing a sentence. I'm trying to go through every single passage in the Bible and the book we are preaching. It's studying and to really go through. As I, it forces me to really look at the Word of God and get full understanding of things. I mean, we're, I'm getting so reminded. Even the same passage I've studied and, and, and really memorized so often, it speaks to me in a different way. I realized Luke, Gospel of Luke, is so much has more zing than Matthew. He said literally, blessed are the poor. Blessed are you, you know, who are hungry right now. He doesn't make it easy. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the poor. That's the kingdom he's calling us. I'm so reminded the gospel that we have. And, you know, and I realize how much of watered down gospel outside, out there. When people say, if you believe God, God will give you everything you want. If you believe, believe God, he will you know, do everything for you. That, I mean, God, our God loves us. He blesses us. But his call to live in this, in this world is not just an easy call. Otherwise, he'll be a false salesman. Tell you only good things, but never tell you the bad thing. He always tell you the bad thing, the good, and tell you what he's inviting you into. And what he's inviting us into, the eternal glory, what outweighs so much more than anything else. So I'm, I'm, I'm so excited that we are celebrating the communion today, we celebrate death of our Lord Jesus Christ. God who suffered for us. That's what communion is about. Communion says our God we serve, love is God who died for us to save us, restore us. And when we gather because of what Christ has done for us. That's what communion is. Amen? We can sing a praise. Let's all stand and sing a praise together.
By the way, when we sing the word Hosanna, Hosanna was the word that people cried out when Jesus first came to Jerusalem on the week when he went to the cross. When he came as you know the uh, uh, triumphant entry into Jerusalem, they cried out Hosanna. Hosanna is really a shout saying God's kingdom to come. When you sing Hosanna, we're saying God, we want you to come. We want you to come and. To bring fullness of your kingdom on earth, that your blessing and your grace, all that you have, fully come on earth. We are asking Christ to come back soon, and that's that's what the praise is about. I love it. We celebrate communion, as I mentioned, as I just alluded early. As we celebrate communion, we are really remembering suffering and death, sacrifice, special love of our Lord Jesus Christ. The night before Jesus went to the cross, and having the Passover meal, Jesus was making a new covenant with them. And he took the bread as a normal part of the Passover. Took the bread and broke it, gave it to them. Ready to fall. They're ready to fall. Oh my goodness! Okay. This is my body, broken for you. He knew exactly in the next few hours he will go to the cross, give his life as a ransom for many. The Bible says, same way he took the cup. And blessed it. And thank you. Said giving to them. This is a new covenant that I make with my blood. He was making a new covenant with his blood. He's, he's just he's remembering. Next few hour, few hours, he will shed his blood. Bible said, you know, without shedding of the blood, there's no forgiveness of sin. He says she's making with his own blood a new covenant. So the God's grace and mercy poured out for us. He was making a new covenant with us. He said, "Come, this is my blood, which he shed for his for the new covenant that he's making with us." Today, I want to invite you today to come. Come and to the table, receive uh, this uh, cup and cup, a uh, cup with the bread, reminding us the sacrifice and love God has for us. And, I, and I, my prayer is that as you come by faith, we partake of His death and suffering. I'm asking that we, I'm asking that we will, God will fully release upon us every spiritual blessing. Everything he has done on the cross for us, we fully release here. In his death, in his suffering, is our forgiveness of sin. In his death and suffering is our healing. In his suffering and death is our redemption. In his death and suffering, all that he has for us is made available to us. So as we as we come and receive the element, Pastor Mimi and I will be standing on each side. You know, we have done this before. If you need some prayer, we'll stop. We'll pray for you. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We honor you. God, who, though you are rich, you became poor for our sake. Through your being poor for our sake, that we may be made rich in you, God. We thank you for your grace. We love you, God. Come. 
We love you, Lord Jesus. We come as people of God, united in faith, united in hope, united in the blood of Christ, united in the spirit of God as the body of Christ, celebrating your goodness and mercy. We love you, God. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Uh, we always say